founders, what's going on? You guys know I love in-person events and they are back. The recording you're about to hear is from our most recent event where we had hundreds of founders come together, share intimate details, templates, KPIs, OKRs about their business, and it was something special, something special. We'd love to meet you in person. If you wanna see the next live events we have coming up via our schedule, the link will be down below in the description. If you're listening on iTunes, check this out on I, uh, YouTube. You'll see the links in the description, or you can just Google Founder Path or Latka next event. We'd love to see you in person. In the meantime, though, enjoy this recording. It's a good one. Good morning, guys. Thanks for having me. My name is Rami Assad. I'm the co founder and CEO of Finmark. Um, as uh, was mentioned, Finmark is financial planning software for startups. But today, I'm here to talk about my last company, Distill Networks. Uh, Distill was a web, uh, a web application security company. We blocked bots for our customers' websites. Um, stopped scrapers, stopped uh, malicious hackers doing a, m a bunch of th crazy things with bots. Um, founded the company in 2011, um, raised my first round of venture capital in 2012, and things really took off after we took some VC money. Um, got really high up there in terms of uh, revenue, scale. Uh, we were... We were kind of by all means doing, uh, doing the VC game and we thought we were gonna be a billion dollar company. Um, in fact, analysts loved us, right? We had accolades from Gartner, Forrester, top right in the Magic Quadrant, top, um, top in the, uh, Forrester, in the um, Forrester wave. Everything seemed like it was going our way. Um, but when you look at our exit in 2019, and you think about you know, where we ended 2018 in terms of revenue, where we were headed for um, in 2019 in terms of revenue, we actually sold for 5x a revenue multiple. Right? When you think about a 5x revenue multiple for a top leading industry categorized, category leader company, that's actually pretty crappy. Right? Most SaaS, and this is pre-pandemic, right? before multiples got really, really crazy like they are now, but back then, a good SaaS company still sold for 10x forward-looking revenue, right? Or at least that's what it traded on for the public markets. But when we sold, we sold in 2019 for a little over $100 million, right? It was about 5x our revenue. Um, the thing that really um, hurts me is that our biggest competitor, who we were ahead of two years before, not just ahead of in terms of reviews and, and um, analyst uh, coverage, but we were ahead of in terms of revenue, outpaced us and sold for a billion dollars that same year. Um, so that, that was a kind of a, a painful piece, right? Like we, we actually invented the category. We were the first to market. Everything was going our way and then everything went wrong in 2017. And that's what I'm here to talk to you guys about. Rami, I'm to your left where you were sitting. One last question. So the last round of funding you took, you sold for like a little over hundred, but the last round of funding you took, what valuation was that at? It was, it was right above what we sold for. Okay. Um, yeah, so the last round of valuation that we took in um, had us valued at and, uh, 140 million pre. And uh, we, we sold for, for under the last round of valuation. Can you just talk a little bit about what that means in terms of a waterfall and then jump into the rest of the story? Yeah, so what that means for, for the waterfall um, is that investors get their money out first before money gets distributed across common. Right, and so that means that we raised, you know, sixty million dollars. That sixty, you know, some of that money goes straight off the top before, um, before, in, uh, before uh, common gets paid out. It also meant that those investors had had a different incentive alignment, right? Um, you know, I'll, I'll talk about this at the very end, but those big investors. Um, pushed us to sell. I actually didn't want to sell. I wanted to keep going. And, and that's my last point that I'll, I'll kind of save there. But, but because they didn't see a path to 5 to 10x their money anymore, um, they, they lost faith that we should keep going. And they said, hey, you know, we'll take a bird in the hand, right? And I, I was saying, hey, guys, like, throughout the wholesale process, I was like, guys, like, we could actually, I think we can easily sell next year for, for 250 million. And they were like, ah, who cares? Right, it's like like a hundred million, hundred and something million, two hundred million. It doesn't really mean anything to us. So these big firms, when you talk to a Bessemer, a Sequoia, when they have billions under management, they either want you to be a, a five ten x, or they just want to get off the board so that they can go on and focus on other companies. And that was a lesson that I learned the hard way. So really great question there, uh, Nathan. Okay, so today we're going to talk about what went wrong. What, you know, what I, I, looking back, some lessons that I learned. Um, but before that, I'm going to like spend a little bit of time talking about some of the things that we did right, 
right? Some, some really key things that I think we, we did do right um, early on that led to the, the early success that we had. Um, one of the, the biggest things that I, I, I look fondly back on is our, the thought leadership that we established, right? We saw the, the Gartner praise, the Forrester Magic Quadrant, all of those things. Um, that took time and energy, right? And, and Nathan, you know, he mentioned this earlier. He doesn't like people up here talking and pontificating, so he wanted me to give you concrete tactics, right? So here's one of the playbook that we used to build analyst coverage, right? To get in front of Gartner, right, as an early stage startup, it's $50,000 for, for the Gartner subscription, another thirty for Forrester, and then four fifty one. dollars You know, that, that adds up. You don't have the money to spend on that. And we all know they say it's not pay to play, but it's kind of pay to play, right? And so how, do you, how can you game that system? Well, so what we did is year one, we realized that we could, we could reach out and schedule briefings with analysts without paying for it. Right? They technically are supposed to talk to vendors and supposed to learn about the market. Now, a lot of those analysts would decline our, our, inter, our uh, briefing request, but some would take the call. When we got on the phone with them, we tell them all about us, but at the very end, we ask, who else in, on your team covers this area? They all work in teams. It's not one person. So we get the name of the next person, and we, we send a briefing request and say, hey, John told me I should talk to you. And that helped increase the number of briefings that we got in terms of this. You want to brief them once a year. This is a numbers game. This is about building rapport with these analysts. And so you're going to have to do this over and over again. This is going to take some time. But if you do it, you'll get the, the accolades, you'll get the recognition, and you'll be included in their reports. Right, year two, as soon as you start p paying, briefing people, what you'll find is that a salesperson is going to reach out to you. Naturally, right? They're in the business of making money. When that salesperson reaches out, leverage them. They, a, an analyst is never going to decline a briefing request from a salesperson, right? So what we did is we gamed it a little bit. We said, listen, we can't afford you right now, but when I raise my Series B, I'm all in. I'm going to subscribe. You got my business. Help me out in the meantime, right? I'm going to raise around next year. Help me out now. And then he started scheduling briefings for me, and we had a much higher hit rate. Right? And what we did is we went to the conference. Right? We would buy a single ticket, and he would schedule in-person briefings. Right? And those in-person briefings really built that rapport. Right? And so by the time you get to year three where, or year four, when you've been working with the salesperson, you've been talking to all of them, you might already have gotten coverage in their cool vendor report or you know, some early coverage. But by the time you actually pony up some money, you have a lot of rapport, a lot of goodwill built up that makes sure that you get, that you get in into the, to their next uh, briefing. So that's one way to game Gartner, Forrester, et cetera, build some of that brand recognition with them before you actually shell out the big dollars that they, that they need you to, to pay. Another thing we did, oh, uh, before I move on to the next thing, the other thing that's really important about working with analysts is always follow up with them. Right? They're in the business of talking about the market, talking about the space, understanding clients' needs. Right? And so what we would do is offer them to talk to a customer, to understand the pain points directly from the horse's mouth. We would give them research reports. Every single um, analyst meeting ended with an email that we would send out to say, here's how we can make you doing your job easier. Same thing for press. When you do a press interview, even if it's just a funding round or anything like that, Follow up with them, offer them information to make their job easier, right? They're having to put out more content than ever, right? And so anything that you can do to grease the skids to make them look smart will endear them to you, right? And so that's one way to build some of that, um, some of that uh, um, expertise and, and coverage. Next thing we did is we hacked conferences. Um, you know, sponsoring a conference is expensive, especially early on, right? So instead of buying a booth, what we would do early on is go buy a ticket or two to a conference, just an attendee ticket, right? Before we get to the conference, we go there a day before, find a bar that's nearby, right? And go to the bartender, go to the general manager and say, hey, I want to invite 25 of my friends over for happy hour. I'm going to give them this little ticket. Um, they're going to have their name and company and email on the back. They show up with one of these, give them a drink. Right? And then at the conference, just hand out a bunch of free drinks. Right? Think about today. Right? Where's everybody going to go at 5 o'clock? Who knows? But if somebody was doing this right now, you could, you could have the whole room come out for a free drink at the bar, and you didn't pay anything for a sponsorship. 
right? At, at a big show, at a South By or at a, um, let's call it a, a CES or Black Hat, you can't do that. All the venues are booked, right? But instead of spending fifty dollars to $100,000 at a big booth, what we would do is host a party, right? And we started off with some decent-sized parties for about ten to $15K, including drinks, including the rental, including a small talent um, hire, you can throw off a pretty decent party. We would do this year after year to a point that people actually got familiar with our parties. People wanted to sponsor my parties. Towards the end, I was putting in $10,000. I had co-sponsors that were putting in $40,000, and I was throwing epic parties where like the headliners, T-Pain, there's a line down the street for people to get in, and it was so much cheaper than, throw, than hi, having a booth. Right, and so that, that party builds that brand recognition across the, the people, right? If I bought you a drink and then I emailed you tomorrow, you're gonna at least respond to my email, right? But if I just scanned your badge at a booth, ah, God, that salesperson again calling me, right? It's a different way to build that reputation. Okay, next thing we did really, really well. We punched the gas on hiring, understanding our drivers when things were going well right? We're like really punched our gas, right? Like our driver was salespeople. When we, for every salespeople, we assigned a quota. We knew how much they were able to make. When most of the team was hitting quota, we punched it, right? And so if you think about it, you look at this, we go, we went from two, we quadrupled, right? Then we, we actually tried to triple. We had a harder time tripling um, from 2014 to 2015. But punching the gas hard, on the core driver that's driving revenue is a place that I see so many founders get skittish, right? Push it to the limit. Figure out where it breaks. You want to know the top speed of your car, right? This is the engine that's driving revenue. Why are you cruising, right? You're in this game to go as fast as possible. If most of your team, if you have 70, 80, 90% of your salespeople hitting quota, your quota is either too low or you're not hiring enough salespeople. Push it push it faster, harder. Now, the, the reason I talk about you know, 2014 to 2015, for example, we tried to grow faster but couldn't, is that you always need to hire more salespeople than, uh, than you want to get to, right? So I wanted to go from eight, I wanted to triple eight, right? But what ended up happening was I added 10 but fired six that same year. Right, so I had, to get, I had to hire 16 to just get to a net of 10 new ads. 25 to 50% of your salespeople are not gonna work out. So always plan ahead and think about how do I fill the funnel with enough people and count attrition in when you're thinking about a, a sales-led revenue driver. Right? So if you really wanna get to a, a, a big speed, make sure you do that. And then the last thing that I think we did really, really well is created a winning culture. Right? We incentivized the behavior that we wanted. A lot of people just think about commissions as like, hey, like this is just how salespeople get paid. But no, commissions are how you get salespeople to do the thing that you want them to do most, right? And so one example of that is we took our sales structure and said, hey, we're going to give you twice as much money if you initiate a conversation with a customer and close it versus if marketing brings in that lead. And what that did is that went, it, it increased in six months, it increased 50% the number of deals that salespeople initiated themselves and increased the revenue um, by, by 20% that they closed themselves. Now, this didn't mean that I paid salespeople twice as much. I just adjusted the commission plan so their OTE was the same, but I incentivized the behavior which led me, allowed me to spend less on marketing or distribute those marketing leads across a, a, a wider pool of people without having, to, um, without having to invest as much, right? And so and I see too many people afraid to use commissions or to, to use that in their, in their, uh, as, a leverage, as a point of leverage. Make sure you do that. Okay. Um, my best salesperson probably made like $350,000, $400,000 as an inside sales rep, which was pretty good for, for an inside sales rep. Uh, my enterprise people, um, I had one or two that broke um, a half a million dollars. Yeah. And the best salespeople that I found that asked me, how do I get to a half million dollars in the interview process? Okay. Uh, enough humble bragging. Um, this is the part of the show that I think everybody's uh, here for, kind of the, the fail porn, if we will. Um, so where did we mess up, right? The first one is I didn't feed reps enough, right? Every time we doubled the size of the, the, the sales team, I doubled the marketing budget. And what I looked at is overall number of leads, overall number of contacts, overall amount of 
um, revenue initiated by marketing versus by sales. I didn't think about the real driver, the real connection, the ratio that mattered the most is how many high value or, or sales qualified leads are given per salesperson from marketing. Simple metric, should have been looking at it, didn't understand that that's the thing that mattered the most. Right? And so having the right metric, it would have told me that every year that we hired more salespeople, they got less and less high value leads for marketing, which meant that when things went really wrong in 2017, they were getting a fraction of what we used to be feeding them to help them hit their quota. Right? Even though I had kept doubling the marketing budget, the efficiency of marketing just wasn't there because I wasn't looking at the right metric. Right? And so make sure that you understand. For me, I said, salespeople are my growth engine. Leads are the lubricant. Right? I, I expected my engine to work without lubricant. And so understand not just what your driver is, but what, is it, what are the, the inputs that you need to make sure that driver works. And the lubricant was lead, high value leads that I didn't keep a close eye enough on. Um, as we scaled up the, the sales team. Next thing, oh, which uh, I, I, uh, uh, a quick uh, shameful plug, that's why we're building Finmark today to help put KPIs front and center in front of every CEO so you understand what you should be measuring and you keep track of the key things that matter the most. That's why I built Finmark now. Okay, next big fail. Um, I didn't understand that product market fit is fluid. Right, when we started Distill, we were the only game in town. It was one, us and one other competitor. And so when we talked to somebody in 2016, 2015, and said, hey, do you have a bot problem? And they said yes, half of those people converted. They were like, yeah, you're the only game in town, awesome. I, as an engineer, thought the problem was that you had bots on your website. The solution is we block most of the bots off of your website. In 2017, Competi new com competitors saw how we good we were doing and came up with new solutions. They weren't nearly as good at blocking bots as we were. And so we discounted and we were like, hey, this is junk, right? Like they block a fraction of the bots that, um, that we have. What we didn't get is that they were five times easier to install and use. And so the convenience thing mattered so much. And that was what product market fit meant, right? P the, the market adapted and People said, hey, I care about ease of use. And, and we didn't adapt our product, we didn't adapt our offering. And so what that meant was, on net, we had 30% of the people that we initiated conversations um, lose. Now we were a growth, at this point, in our growth phase, right? So we thought this was a, a, a fault of the growth engine. We thought the growth engine was broken. We didn't think, we didn't sit down and go back to first principles and say, is product market fit really there? Right? Is there something that we should be doing on the product front? And the key indicator here, if you look at how many people from the uh, last slide, how many people moved on from a, an initial conversation, it was the vast majority. It was like 90-something percent. But in, from the, moving forward, before they even cut deeper into things, we lost a third of the, tra of the conversations right there at the very top place. That, that, should, that should have been an, uh, one of many alarm bells that should have rung off in my head that said, hey, something's happening way too early for this to be like a growth engine issue, right? Something's happening here. So there were some key in leading indicators that I, I just didn't think about. Last big fail was bad financial planning. Again, this is why I'm building Finmark because it, it just hurts me, right? The key number to look at, you may not be able to see it here. I can't read it here off of the screen, but the key number is when we went into 2017, we thought we were gonna add um, 100%, we were gonna grow 100% um, that year, right? We were gonna add about $15 million of new ARR, minus churn, whatever it was gonna get to be double um, the, the year prior in terms of uh, entering ARR. Four months later, we had slashed that forecast for, 20, um, for 2017 by almost 50%. But it was like about 45%. We said, we're, we're not gonna add 15 million of new, we're gonna get about nine point something of new. Um, now, we, that should have been like alarm bells. But what happened was we reforecasted in February and lowered it a little bit. We reforecasted in March and lowered it a little bit. From April, we lowered it a little bit. May, we lowered it a little bit. So like those incremental pieces, we didn't go back and say, hey, what did we say we were going to do in December to January? Okay, something's off here. Um, we thought we were just, our, go back to this race car analogy. We thought we had a flat tire, but we had run flats. Let's keep cruising. Let's fix things up. Like we're, you know, we're having some bumps, so we, we, we'll fix this. 
In reality, this was the engine light on and smoke coming out of the engine. I should have been punching the brake and slowing everything the fuck down right then and there, but I didn't. We didn't actually react to these bad numbers. We kept lowering forecasts. We didn't react till July of that year where we laid off a third of the company, right? Had I reacted in March and April, had I seen this coming? This should have been red flags, red alarms. Had I seen this coming? It would have made a big difference because what happens is when you punch the brakes, right, things get really wobbly, right? To, to, and then to rebuild, to get back up to that top speed, we had done so much damage to the engine that we can never achieve that same top speed again, right? Um, you know, it, think about it. If you're driving with your check engine light on, something's going to break, right? So you got to stop. You got to be adaptive. You got to have these numbers. And as soon as you see something off, Pull the, pull the e-brake, slow down, fix it, and then speed back up because otherwise you're, you're not going to be able to get there again. All right. So there's also some things that, God, I, I wish I had even thought about. I didn't even think about when we were doing it. Right? The first one is talking to potential acquirers. What's wild to me is I treated potential acquirers as competition. I treated them like the enemy. Right, like a, a, a company that's doing application security, even if they weren't in bot, they would want to reach out. Their corp dev people would reach out to talk to us. I'm like, ah, I don't want to talk to you. Nah, I want to keep you at arms. Like, you're the enemy. You're gonna take my ideas, and then you're gonna go talk to your developers, and then you're gonna just copy us. These are corp dev people. These are business people. They don't understand the depth of technology. Their whole job is to find companies to buy. I should have been building relationships with them. Because at the end of the day, when it was time to sell, you look at four, 24 potential acquirers, our banker talked to 24 people, eight of them were like, I don't even see the synergy. There was synergy, we knew there was synergy, but they didn't know the synergy because I never talked to those companies before, right? And then of the people that took the intro call, again, half dropped off. Because they were like, ah, this isn't a priority. I should have been, I should have been helping them understand why this is such a big important thing so that they want to invest in us. Of the eight actual people, eight companies that dug in, really dug in, and, and you know, some made an offer, some didn't, four of which I had actually had prior relationships with, right? So had I built prior relationships with all the 24, I know that final number would have been a lot more than four, right? And the only reason I had built those prior relationships is because those corp dev people kind of were a little bit more assertive on connecting with me, coming to our office, talking on a regular basis. And they didn't, they didn't just take my rebuffs. They you know, would meet with me at conferences. They, they took the initiative to build the rapport. And the most aggressive one was Imperva, who had, made, you know, had come to our office several times. That relationship is there. That's why that deal got done. And, and I wish, I wish I had done more of that much earlier on. I know in my heart of hearts that absent anything else, we would have sold for 25 to 50% more had we just had better relationships with the potential acquirers. The next thing that I didn't do is I didn't leverage my network. I didn't actually understand that business gets done by referrals. I was so focused on building this engine that was you know, self-sustaining and like salespeople come in and then they make revenue. Less than 20% of our deals um, through the life cycle of Distill were from customer referrals or VC refers, referrals. Now I've more than doubled that, right? I literally ask my VCs for customer referrals, referrals nonstop. I, hell, I asked Nathan to introduce me to three potential clients and one potential partner um, before I came to the, to, the, to the conference. There's no shame in getting these connections, right? Business is done with relationships. And so leverage every relationship, leverage every customer, leverage every investor for a referral because you know what, when we like something, when we have uh, affinity towards a product or towards uh, a service, we're okay with referring it. We don't mind making a referral. I, I speak, I, I tell people all the time, you know, about my favorite tools because I like them so much that I want other people to use them too, right? And so ask for that referral. I wish I had done more of that. I think that could have made my life a lot easier. Um, again, going back to tactical things that like, you know, Nathan wants to see, here's an artifact. At the end of every investor update, or actually at the beginning of every investor update, I put front and center and ask, and I make it stupid simple for them to make introductions, right? Um, here's a PDF, here's the type of company that we're looking for, please make introductions, right? Just 
always, always continue to beat that drum beat. And cha I change up the ask, right, so that they don't have fatigue, but I constantly, I ask for referrals, ask for connections all the time, all right? Um, the last one um, might, might hit home for, for some of you guys, and, and I didn't create a work-life balance. I mean, starting a startup is hard. We barely knew what we were doing. We were sprinting 110% the entire time. Right? And, and we did. We just kept going, kept going, kept pushing. Um, when it came to the end, what I learned was I still had juice, right? Like, I loved this thing. I wanted to keep going. My investors were like, hey, like, let's, let's you know, we're kind of at the top of the, the, the leadership board in terms of, like, coverage and analysts. Let's, let's try to sell this thing. Let's see what we can do. The thing that really shocked me was my key employees and my co-founders, agreed with the investors, they wanted to sell. And why? Because they were tired. We had just been sprinting for like eight years. And this is life-changing money for me and my co-founders, right? Like we still got, like we would never have to work again if we didn't want to. And, and I, I was so, that was the thing that hurt me the most. I was like, guys, we've been in this together for so, we've been through so much shit together. Like now, now you guys wanna bail? And they're like, dude, like we're out. And it just taught me, like, we should have been treating this like a marathon. We could have been having more fun. We could have been st less stressed out, and we could have probably kept going. And if we had kept going, we would have had more time to, I think, do things better and probably have a much better outcome. So um, this time around, I'm very, very diligent about work-life balance for myself, for my co-founders, for the whole team. Uh, that matters a lot to me now, and I, I wish I had done that. So with that... You know, hopefully that was uh, some, some good lessons. I'll do one more shameful, uh, shameless plug here. Come see us. We have a booth. Um, understand the KPIs that matter to you. Understand your growth drivers. Put those front and center to you. That's what uh, Finmark is. And uh, thank you guys for having me. Hopefully this was helpful. <laughs>